CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. To herald its ninth season on the air... The Mystery Theater is presenting that classic story of crime and retribution, Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. We have been tracing the story of Jean Valjean, who served a 19-year sentence for stealing a loaf of bread. After an aborted attempt to steal silverware from a kindly bishop, he has gone straight. So straight, in fact, that he was regarded by everyone in the town of Moulin as the paragon of kindness and generosity factory owner, and, eventually, mayor. But his life as an honest man was cut short by fate. And once again, Jean Valjean found himself in prison. Valjean, what did you do? I made it. I ran. They didn't catch me. Listen to that bell. They ring it like that when there's death or trouble. The nuns must have seen you. It doesn't matter. I have the ivory crucifix. Yes. Yes, they saw me. I knew it. That's why the alarm bell. Jean, you can't hide here. They'll find you. And that will mean prison again. Our drama, No Escape, part three of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, has been especially adapted for the Mystery Theater by Gerald Keane and stars Alexander Scooby as Jean Valjean and Bernard Grant as Javert. I shall return shortly with Act One. Our Mystery Theater curtain rises on Episode 3 of The Study of Crime and Social Injustice, Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. Our stage is set to reveal the tale of an ex-convict, Jean Valjean, who tries to live according to the law, but is relentlessly pursued by one man who had dogged his trail for 20 years. This man is a police inspector by the name of Javert. I am Javert. It was I who knew deep down and all along the man masquerading as the mayor of Moulin was none other than the ex-prisoner Jean Valjean. For a reason which I must confess I cannot fathom. In order to protect an idiot who looked like him, this Valjean admitted in an open court he was the real ex-convict. I arrested him. Now, it is 12 years after his incarceration. And again, he has escaped from prison and disappeared. If I do nothing else in life, I shall find him. Marcel. Huh? How is it to call my name? Who are you standing in the dark in my cottage? I've been waiting for you, Marcel. Uh, who are you? Do you remember the Mayor Madeleine? Mayor Madeleine? Yes. The, the one who confessed he was a criminal and, and was arrested? Is that all you remember about me, Marcel? Who was it who secured for you the post of gardener in this convent? It was you, the Mayor. <laughs> How did you get here? Monsieur Madeleine himself. I can't get over it. Not Madeleine. I am Jean Valjean. Remember? Marcel, I'm glad you're still alive. I have so few I can turn to. If you had not lifted the cap from my back that day, I would not now be alive. <laughs> Forgive me. Oh, that was so long ago. Oh, how long? My memory press tricks. Twelve years. I... I thought they condemned you to life imprisonment. I escaped. But why are you here? This convent of Saint Antoine is no place to hide. The sisters of mercy are not allowed to give sanctuary to an escaped convict. Marcel, I have not come here to hide. 
I have come to get the daughter of a woman who should not have died so young. At her bedside, I swore to her I would protect her daughter. That she would always be taken care of. Her daughter is here at saint Antoine. I pray so. I, I hope so. When the child was six years old, I brought her here. The mother superior promised me she could stay. Now I have come for her. Will you help me, Marcel? Uh, yeah. Who is she? What is her name? Cosette. Cosette? Yes. Oh, oh yes, 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 I know her. She, she, she never entered the order. She comes to the gardens often and helps me. She is 18 now. Don't tell me. Is it you she is always talking about? Are you the grandfather she speaks about? When she was little and her mother died, I led her to believe that. I told her when I brought her here that one day I would return and we would have a home. But, as you say, I am a hunted man. So I cannot openly ring the gate bell and inform the mother superior I wish to take Cosette. Now look at the way I'm dressed. My clothes are rags covered by this cape and this wide-brimmed hat. But you will help me, I know. When will I do this? Tonight, if it is possible. For you, anything I can do, I will, but we shall have to wait till morning when Cosette comes into the gardens where I'm planting and weeding. Tomorrow, then. I thank you. For saving my life, Jean Valjean. How can I ever do enough? Mademoiselle Cosette. Good morning, Marcel. Oh, what a beautiful day it is. Did I ever tell you, Mademoiselle, that uh, I knew your grandfather? Well, no. You never said a word, did you? All these years, and you never said a word. I did not expect to see him ever again. You are joking about seeing my grandfather. Oh, no. It is not a joke. I have seen him. He came last night to take you away. I cannot believe it. Where is he? I am to arrange everything. He does not wish to disturb the mother superior, and so he asks that you leave the convent alone. Just by myself? Yes. When? Tonight. As soon as it is dark. After the evening prayer at six, you have to walk to the bottom of the main road. The hedge of wild roses. Huh? There will be a hay wagon waiting for you. You are not to speak to the driver. You are to get in, and you will be taken to your destination. I, Javert, chief of inspectors, did not know that Jean Valjean had escaped from prison or that he had returned to Paris. In fact, he occupied very little place in my mind until one day in December, I was called into the commissioner's office at the Paris prefecture. Javert! Remember Jean Valjean, the condemned prisoner you had so much trouble with? I do indeed, Commissioner. The man is dead. Really? Look at this report. Escaped. Fell in the Seine and drowned. I thought you'd be interested. That's why I sent for you. Well, 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 well. This is a piece of good news. And here's another piece of news. Interesting how these related events come in bunches. A report that last night a girl of 18 was kidnapped from the convent of Saint Antoine. A nun was kidnapped? No, no. A young girl who was boarding there had been there since she was a child of six. I don't see any connection with the Valjean affair. <laughs> the girl's name is Cosette. And the Sisters of Mercy reported that her deceased mother's name was... Fantine. 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 Ah, an unusual name. Fantine. I thought it might ring a bell. Seems a stranger has been seen in the area the day before yesterday. A tall man with a cape and a wide-brimmed hat pulled over his head. This uh, stranger, they think, walked in and made off with her. What do you think of that? I don't know what to think. Especially since it says here 
Sir Jean is dead. Hmm. I merely pass along the information. But I do remember a dozen years ago, after the Jean confession that he was posing as Monsieur Madeleine, the mayor, when you went to arrest him, wasn't he at the bedside of a dying woman called Fantine? You have a good memory. What is the name of that convent? Saint Antoine. The patron saint, by the way, of the hard pressed. Jean, what happened yesterday? All went well. But why are you back here tonight? Cosette is installed in a small place near the Luxembourg Garden. Oh, you are mad to come back here. The mother superior is furious. Mm. The sisters are searching everywhere for Cosette. They had me on the carpet for hours. The police came. Sister Therese passed away at midnight. Oh, such a day, such a day. I had to come back for Cosette's clothes. All she took was on her back. I beg you. Go now. The clothes are not worth your safety. Cosette wants a crucifix that belonged to her mother. The ivory crucifix, yes. Yes. I know it. It is still in the room over her bed. Can you get it for me? No, no, no. I, I, I can't ask that of you. You show me where her room was. Draw me a map. I'll find the ivory crucifix myself. Marcel, I want that map now. Marcel, Marcel. What did you do? Listen to that bell. It is wrong that way when there is death or trouble. They must have seen you. It doesn't matter. I have the crucifix. Yes, they saw me. Two sisters walked in the door as I was pulling it from the wall. They ran out, shouting for the mother superior. I knew it. I knew it. You cannot hide here. They'll find you. Marcel. Marcel, are you? Blessed Virgin. There she is. The mother superior. Get under the bed. Yeah. Under the bed. Marcel. May I speak with you? Uh, uh, certainly, Mother Superior. Uh, what is the matter? The man. The man with the wide brimmed hat. He has returned. What man? The one seen in the village before Cosette disappeared. I have sent for the police. And Marcel, I want you to stand by the gate. The inspector and his men could be here any time. That this should happen the night our dear sister Teresa was called to the bosom of the Lord. Don't worry. I will show the police everywhere. Not the bedroom, of course. It would be sacrilege. Our beloved sister Teresa passed over, lying there, awaiting her burial tomorrow in the vault under the chapel altar. Marcel, I count on you. Be at the gate. Now I must go and stop that bell. Ah, The damage is done. You can come out. Now, yeah. under the bed. You heard her. A fine mess we are in. The police are bound to come in here. Where can I hide you? I'll go the way I came, over the wall. No, no, no. You can't do that. Who knows where the police are patrolling? And the dogs. No, 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 Marcel. They won't catch me. I've made a career of escape. Wait. I have an idea. Hmm? You will take the place of Sister Therese. Of the sister who will be buried under the chapel. It is one of my duties to take care of funerals, nail up the coffins, and assist the grave digger at the cemetery. Sister Therese wishes to be buried in her own coffin. Now, do not laugh, but she has used a coffin as a bed for the last 20 years, and we shall bury her under the altar to respect her dying wish. That leaves me... With a second coffin. A second coffin? A government coffin. The government sends a coffin. The next day, it sends the earth. And the undertaker of men to carry it to the cemetery. I accompany it. You, dear friend, will be in it. Marcel. (laughs) A stroke of genius. I couldn't have thought of a better escape myself. Oh, but... Another thought. Eh? Um, uh, how will you breathe? No, well, don't hammer all the nails down. Where my head is, leave 
the space of a centimeter. Once in the grave, I'll pry it open. If anyone can do this, it is you. I do not know where you find the courage. I have an ivory crucifix in my hand. And a young girl who waits for her grandfather. That is the source of my strength. How cleverly Victor Hugo draws tight the strings that bind his characters. The terror and the sadness of a man banging his head against the stone wall of society. When our play is over, I'll tell you what happened in Hugo's own personal life that triggered this epic drama. I shall return shortly with Act Two. to report that via the coffin and the grave, Jean Valjean did make his escape to the Latin quarter of Paris, where he rejoined his ward, Cosette. The months pass. It is spring, and as Victor Hugo designs the fate of his characters, he introduces us to Marius, a young man who lives on the floor below in the same house. Are you Marius? Uh, I am, monsieur. And you? Coforac, your landlord. Uh, oh, we haven't met. I generally deal with the concierge. You've come for the rent. Monsieur Marius, you are a month in arrears. I cannot run an apartment house like that. I also have bills to pay. Well, I happen to be very short now. I'm about to take my bar examination. You have no relatives who could lend you something extra to tide you over? Oh, my parents are dead. I had a small inheritance. It's almost all gone. I'm afraid I'm quite alone in the world. Perhaps uh, a friend who would extend a loan. Yes, one. A student lawyer like myself. He lives with his mother, but I would never borrow a sou from Paul. Then uh, what are we going to do? Well, perhaps you could wait. How little money do you have? Fifteen francs. Uh, you're a nice young man, and I'm sure you will make your way in the world. I certainly won't press you for the rent, but you will need more than 15 francs to live on until you are a practicing lawyer. <laughs> I realize that. Uh, have you clothes you could sell? Uh, just what you see in the armoire over there. Any jewelry? A gold watch. Uh, may I have a look? Oh, as you please. <gasps> ah, I have an idea. Do you know English? No, I don't. Not very well. Do you know German? Not really. I, I know a little of both languages, but not much. Oh, that is too bad. Why so? Well, a friend of mine, a publisher, is preparing an encyclopedia for which you could have translated English or German articles. The pay is little, but at least it's possible to live on. Well, I, I will improve my English and German. But... In the meantime, Marius, I will have to eat my clothes and my watch. Marius, whatever is the matter with you? The, the Paris winter is over. It's April. You look so glum. Oh, forgive me, Paul. I I'm not unhappy, really. It's anxiety, I think. You're anxious about what? Spring is in the air. We both passed our bar exams. I'm going to be apprenticed to a law firm. You have a translating job with a publisher. If I tell you, you'll laugh at me. We, we turn this way. But if we go straight, we can feed the swan. But Paul, please. I, I wish to go this way. Ah, there is a secret reason we are taking this path. Hmm? A, a woman? Marius, you have a rendezvous with a woman? Is that the problem? I have no rendezvous. That is the problem. Oh, she is beautiful? Oh, yes. What does she say to you, this love of your life? We've never talked. Not said a word? <laughs> you just look at one another? Uh, she doesn't look at me. Oh, how sad. How long have you been doing this? Since February. Oh, she walks in these gardens every day. The two of you alone and separately, walking in the Luxembourg and never speaking? Marius, this is tragic. No, she's not alone. She's with a white-haired, tall gentleman. Come, come, come. We, we must walk faster. 
Marius, what is your hurry? Well, I must get to a certain park oh. bench before she arrives. Oh. They're already here. They are? Where, where, where? Over there. See? Well, now what? We sit on this bench right here. I, I have a book in my pocket. I sit here and pretend to read, see? And without being observed, I can sneak a look at her over my book. Oh, isn't she beautiful? Well, the old man is nice looking, too. I think I know those two from somewhere. You do? My dear Marius, if you wish to get to know this girl, you'll have to do better than sitting yards away in a park day after day. Well, I will, I will. When they leave here tomorrow, I shall follow them and find out where she lives. <laughs> you don't know that? Well, I can tell you that. She lives in the same house as you do. That's where I've seen her before, and him. She lives in the same house. Gret? Gret? Is that you wandering about the apartment this time of night? Oh, I am sorry, Grandfather. I did not mean to wake you. But I could not sleep. But I am glad you are awake. The strangest things have been happening. Something always seems to wake me at midnight. Hmm? It started about, oh, two weeks ago. I did not want to say anything. I did not want to alarm you. Do you stay up long? One hour, two hours. Oh. Finally, I talk myself into going back to bed. But tonight it was worse. What? What was worse? The man in the cape. Oh? Tonight he looked up at me and saw me. I know he saw me standing at the window. Well, what kind of cape? What man? I wear a cape. The cape of a gendarme of high rank. He has been standing across the street and watching this house. Sometimes he sits on the bench, but he never looks away. So tonight, when our eyes met, I felt I had to go downstairs and find out why he was there. While I was sleeping, you went outside in the middle of the night in your nightdress? I put on slippers and this coat over me, but I did not go outside. I went down, opened the door slowly, but the man in the cape had gone. I don't want you ever to do that again, Cosette. To go out in the dead of night, you could be murdered, anything. You frighten me so, Grandfather. I mean to. This is serious. But... Tomorrow night, I shall watch from this window myself. And then we shall see. You don't sound a bit afraid. I'm not. I shall never again be afraid. Now, go to bed, my dear. And sleep well. Marius, I must have been out of my head to sit on that bench with you today, waiting for the girl. And the only one on the opposite bench was the man with the white hair. I can't understand it. It's never happened before. He came alone. There must be something wrong. Why you cannot get to know them in your own house is beyond me. It's my fault. You see, Paul, I... I'm ashamed of the few clothes I still have, and, and so I leave the house by the back stairs. It never occurred to me that you look shabby. Paul, will you come up to my room for a few minutes? Oh, I promised my mother I'd be home in time for dinner, so I must leave you. Oh, Paul, Paul. Yes? I'll pick you up tomorrow. Tomorrow. Monsieur, I beg your pardon. May I have a word with you before you step inside your house? Certainly. I always enjoy a word with a man in a cape when it represents the law. I am Javert, inspector of police. You are Marius, are you not? Yes, how did you know? It is my business. Do you know a man with white hair who lives in your house with a girl of 18, blue-eyed, slim, long, blonde hair? Why do you ask me at least a dozen people live here. Come now, Marius. One of my men who has been keeping watch here tells me that almost every day you go to the Luxembourg Gardens and have been sitting on a bench quite near the man and the girl. I go to the gardens to read. 
Uh, as for the inference, your operative is mistaken. I don't know the people you speak of. I have never met them. I have never talked with them. Uh, may I ask, what is the reason you wish such information? You may ask, but I cannot answer you. Come here, Cosette. Come here to the window. What do you see? Where? Down in the street in front of the house. That's the young man, isn't it? Yes. The one we've talked about who watches us in the Luxembourg Gardens. Do you know whom he's talking to? The man in the cape. Who is he? His name is Javert. He has been plaguing me since before you were born, my child. He is the inspector of police. Now, will you believe me? When I tell you the young man who has been watching us almost every day in the past month is not only smitten with you, there's more to it. It's me that he is watching. I don't know how long we have before the police intend to storm this house and take me with them. But I can tell you this, Cosette. We are not waiting up here to find out. <laughs> Javert, how can you be so positive this man with white hair you describe is Valjean? It's a feeling I have, Commissioner. And you expect me to issue a warrant to search the house on the basis of that? A hunch? I repeat, the elderly man has a young woman with him. It could be the 18-year-old Cosette who disappeared from the convent. It's possible. But we have only the vaguest description of the girl. There are many slim, blue-eyed, blonde girls of the same age on every street in Paris and more indoors. No. No, I cannot issue a warrant. A French citizen still has some right, Chevert. I don't have to tell you one needs actual proof. Do you have any? I will get it. And now I suggest you attend to your duties and forget this man. Commissioner, may I be given a fortnight's leave without pay? May I have that? You believe so strongly that the white-haired man is Valjean? An escaped convict must be returned to serve out his sentence. If the law is not obeyed, what is left but anarchy... <laughs> No matter where he wishes to stop and rest, Jean Valjean cannot. Javert is always at his heels, a nemesis, a strange officer of the law, not indifferent or impartially weighing transgressions upon the scales of justice, but relentless and, yes, revengeful. How long can Valjean endure this? Who will weaken first? The ex-prisoner... Or the policeman, the hunted, or the hunter. I shall return shortly with Act Three. This unyielding pursuit through the years has made Jean Valjean more wary and Javert more impatient. Is it justice that Javert seeks? or vengeance. One has the feeling that as long as Valjean lives, so does Javert. If Jean Valjean were no more, Javert would die, having no reason to live. Javert speaks. The trap must be cleverly sprung and carefully baited. In order to set it, I needed proof to get that proof, I had to hear his voice. A doctor occupied the upstairs apartment next to the man I believed was Valjean. I arranged with this doctor to leave his apartment, and I found him another. At first he was reluctant, but I persuaded him. For the sake of law, sometimes arms have to be twisted. Shortly afterwards, I went to see the landlord. There's only one other family on the third floor. To be honest with you, monsieur, this third floor was originally 
one big apartment, but uh, I had partitions put up making it into two apartments. That's too bad. A partition is only a very thin wall. I don't think you will be disturbed, monsieur. The other family on that floor is an elderly gentleman and his granddaughter. I hope you won't think this impertinent of me, monsieur, but may I ask your name and where you work? I am Inspector Javert of the Paris Police. I am engaged in a matter of delicate surveillance. You will, of course, not make mention of this to any of your lodgers. Good day. Shut the door, Cosette. Oh, wasn't that a nice walk we had today, Grandfather? I love watching the boats on the Seine. Lock it. Oh, do you mean that? Lock the door, yes, please. Oh. Cosette, sit down. I want to speak to you. Before I have made us afternoon coffee? Cosette. Cosette, I am not really your grandfather. What? When your mother was alive, you were very little. You and she lived in a town not far from Paris. Moulin. Do you remember that? Oh, yes. I think I do. Mm. Your mother had a beautiful name. I'm sure you remember that. Mm. Fantine. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I promised her I would take care of you always. Cosette, my real name is Jean Valjean. Once when I was very young, almost your age, I stole a loaf of bread because my sister and her seven little ones were starving. Mm. I was sent to the worst prison in France, Toulon. My dear child, I paid for that crime with 19 years of my life. When I got out, I was bitter against the world. I wasn't out of prison long before I... I stole some silver from a bishop. But he was a very good man. And he told the police he had given me the silver. It was the first kind thing anyone had done for me in 20 years. He brought me to the safety of the Lord and made me promise to lead a good life. And I did, Cosette. It's been said that I put the town of Moulin on the map of France. I started a glass bead factory where your mother worked. I, I built a hospital, tried to help everyone I could. But I was sent back to prison. For what? There is on this earth one man... A police officer whose name is Javert. He was an assistant jailer in Toulon where I was first imprisoned. He has never let me be. He always suspected that I, who was now known as Monsieur Madeleine, the respected mayor of Moulin, was in truth Jean Valjean. One day, a poor, demented creature who looked very much like me was arrested. Because everyone swore he was me, he would have been sent to prison for his whole life. I could not let him suffer in my place. I had no choice but to give myself up. Why do you tell me all this now? Because I am certain once again they have found me out. I think you're chasing a will of the wisp. He's wily. He's clever. I took rooms next to his, Commissioner. Last night, I listened at the wall that separates our apartments. He never made a sound. I don't understand. It's his voice I want to hear. That voice that I've heard so often in Moulin. Then I will know he is very John. Ah, yes, 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 yes. He never made a sound, I tell you. Is that normal? Not one word, all evening. Now, I could hear them eating a dinner she had prepared, washing up the dishes, but the entire time, not one word was spoken. Uh, it seems this man divines he is being observed. Tonight, I will smoke him out. If he tries to escape, I want him to run into the arms of our men. May I have three? All right. All right. 
hilarious. It seems to me your entire life is being spent sitting, waiting on park benches. Here you are on the bench outside your own house. Do you know it's after five o'clock now? Look. Two policemen and a third. They've stopped, looked in the doorway. Now they're moving on. What's the matter, Marius? You've gone quite white. Yesterday, after you left me, a police inspector named Javert stopped me and asked after them. Asked about the white-haired man and your girl? Yes. Wanted to know what I knew about them. I, I told him nothing. Oh, that is peculiar. How much longer are you going to sit out here? I don't know. Oh, you are stubborn. Oh, no, I am in love. All right. I'll wait with you one more half hour, and that's it. I told you, Marius, it was too late for them to go walking in the park. I wasted half a day. I, I feel like a fool. The only reason I'm going up to your place is I expect the reward of a glass of wine. Oh, you may have two glasses, Paul. Marius, you're behaving like an idiot over that girl. Shh, shh, not so loud. They're right above us and they'll hear us. There are important things happening these days in France. Only you're too lovesick to know what's going on. France is on the brink of another revolution, and we need all the bright, intelligent men like you on our side. I'm not interested in politics. Now, now please be quiet. Their apartment is right up there at the head of the stairs, the third floor. Is that you, Marius? Uh, yes, it is, Monsieur Kafarak. Who is that? The landlord. He's up there on the landing above us. I left the mop in the pail down where you are. Will you bring it up to me, please? You take the mop, Paul. I'll carry the pail. Go on. He, he's a nice man, and I owe him several months' rent. Ah, thank you, Marius. Bring the pail in here. Uh, you too, sir, with the mop. Uh, just uh, lean it against the wall. Well, this is, uh... Uh, who lives in this apartment? No one at the moment. I'm doing a little cleaning, and hopefully I'll have it to enter this week. Is this where the gentleman with the white hair and the young lady, uh, is this theirs? It was. I was sorry to lose them. But the gentleman came to me at six this morning and said they had to leave immediately. They have left? For good? So far as I know. They took everything, as you can see. By seven, they were all paid up. Half hour later, a van came for their things, and off they went in a handsome cab. Oh, that can't be. It's impossible. You have no idea where they went. I didn't say that. They were catching the afternoon train to Cherbourg, and from there, the night boat to England. called the kidnapped young lady are now out of our jurisdiction. If indeed they have gone to England, content yourself with the fact there is nothing we here in Paris can do about it. Yes, Henri? There is a Monsieur Courfeyac here. He says the inspector asked him to come here if he found anything of value in an apartment recently vacated. Commissioner, this may be a lead. May we ask him in? Uh, Henri, bring the man to my office. Corfeyrac is the landlord of that house. It was here you informed me those two had left for England. I sincerely hope we can dispose of this matter quickly. Word from the Bois, the Rue Saint-Croix, and 20 different spots in Paris is that there are groups gathering, a riot brewing. I am going to need you, Gervais, to go out and organize police patrols where they are needed. I was... Told to come up here? Come in, Coffee Rock. This is the commissioner. Ah, an honor. Uh, what have you found? I have it all here in my pocket. I wrapped it up in my handkerchief. Scraps of paper under the mattress. I didn't find them until I turned the mattress over to make the bed with fresh linen, which I always do for new tenants. Uh -huh. ah, here it is. Do uh, you see Scraps of paper it is, torn up into small pieces. You did the right thing, Coffee Rock. I think this 
piece belongs in that corner. Ah, it's a yellow passport. By heaven, a yellow passport. Well, Jean must have torn it up and placed it under his mattress, planning to get rid of it. Javert, my apologies. Look, V A L J E A. Yeah, well, uh, the rest of it is here somewhere. Ah, uh, Javert, my apologies. You were right. I'll be the first to acknowledge it. Unfortunately, if he has skipped to England, there is little we can do about apprehending him. I shall get him. If it's the last thing I ever do. One must not threaten the fates that way. What good would it do you if it were the last act of your life? Now let's bend our efforts towards suppressing this riot before it turns into a full-scale revolution. In the 1830s in France, if one did not like the government, one did not vote it out, one shot it out. Writes Victor Hugo, about six in the evening the streets were a battlefield. The rioters at one end, the troops at the other. Jean Valjean had gone out to have a look and was caught between two fires for nearly half an hour. End quote. All, by the way, reminding you that Victor Hugo himself experienced what he wrote about. I shall return shortly. Episode 3 of Victor Hugo's Magnificent Les Miserables. I promised you a behind-the-scenes look at the author himself and why he had no choice but to write this great novel. It grew out of tragedy, a personal tragedy. On September 4, 1843, Victor Hugo picked up a newspaper in a cafe and learned that his recently married daughter, Leopoldine, had drowned in the Seine. That night, he began writing this book always remembered for its extraordinary humanity. Join us again when our curtain rises on this unusual five-part presentation to signal the start of Mystery Theater's ninth year on the air. Our cast included Alexander Scorby, Bernard Grant, E.V. Jester, Bob Caliban, and Lloyd Batista. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our Mystery Theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.